This is Peter Sloan. I'm a physician in Baltimore, continuing on to the second part of a four-part series on basic interpretation of pulmonary function tests. In the first part, we talked about basic definitions and spirometry along with flow volume loops. In part two, I'll cover the measurement of lung volumes and diffusion capacity. To review, from the first lecture, or talk, I should say, we defined lung volumes as mutually exclu exclusive volumes that stack up to form total lung capacity. But we really never talked about how we could measure residual volume or any of the lung volumes or capacities that include the residual volume, which I'm going to highlight right over here. So here's the problem. We have a residual volume which cannot be measured spirometrically. Total lung capacity cannot be measured spirometrically because we don't know what's down here. And the functional residual capacity cannot be measured spirometrically. So what are we to do? We have a method of measuring all of these volumes called helium dilution and then an alternate method with body box plethysmography. So how does helium dilution work to measure these unknown volumes? We connect the patient whose lung volumes are unknown to a closed system of gas with a known volume of air containing a known concentration of helium. During tidal volume breathing, we open a valve between the patient and the reservoir at the moment that the patient is at their functional residual capacity. We assume the system is closed. What we mean is there's no leaks of the system into the room at the patient's mouth and we also assume that the helium in the system stays in the system and doesn't significantly diffuse into the bloodstream by uptake. We choose helium because it's fairly non-diffusible. After we get through these assumptions, we simply allow the helium to equilibrate by dilution to a final concentration over several minutes. Using the final concentration, we can calculate the functional residual capacity using the principle of conservation of mass. And once we know the FRC, we can then calculate residual volume and total lung capacity using other spirometric values. It's important to note that helium dilution only measures the gas in the chest that communicates with the mouth, so that if we have bully in the lung that are closed-necked, closed-neck bully, that are air spacing bullous disease in the lungs that don't communicate with the mouth, the volume of gas in those bullies are not measured by helium dilution because helium did not have a chance to get into the bully and dilute to a lower concentration. So let me show you how the volume is done graphically. In the initial state, we take a reservoir of helium that the computer knows its volume. Let's in this example, say it's 2 liters, and it knows the concentration of helium. Let's assume it's 8 units per liter. And we have a closed valve connected to the patient who has an unknown volume. We're going to open the volume when the patient's at their functional residual capacity. So that's actually what we're going to want to measure. But we do know that the patient has effectively no helium in their lungs at the beginning. The final state is such that we open the valve, I mark that as green, and then the dark blue helium, which is very concentrated, mixes back and forth and back and forth until it comes to final concentration, which I indicated with an intermediate color of light blue. Well, the computer can measure the concentration in the final, final system. In this example, I have the concentration at two units per liter, per liter, which we would say is a fourfold dilution. The concentration in the reservoir and the patient are the same because we're at steady state equilibrium. Two units per liter, two units per liter. It's dilute because it used to be eight units per liter, but now it's diluted over the larger volume. And the only question remaining is, what is the FRC? You can do it logically. There is a fourfold dilution from eight to two. Therefore, the volume must have gone from 2 to 8 liters. Or you can do it with a formula. Here's the formula. The initial amount of helium in the system, 2 liters 
8 units per liter, there were 16 units of helium in the reservoir. And at the end, there is still 16 units, but it's in a larger volume, 2 liters plus the added volume of FRC, at a lower concentration of 2. If we solve this equation, FRC is 6 liters, meaning the entire system is 2 plus 6, which is 8 liters, which makes sense. In going from 8 units per liter to 2 units per liter, we have increased the system volume from 2 to a total of 8, making the patient's volume 6 liters. It's simply a simple dilution experiment. That's the principle of helium dilution. Body box plethysmography, plethysmography is a completely different principle to measure the same type of a total lung capacity. It, this test is intended to measure all of the gas in the chest and does not depend on communicating with the mouth because we're not using helium and we're not depending on dilution. The principle of body box plethysmography is based on Boyle's law of gases, which means, which is to say that the pressure times the volume is a constant as long as the amount of gas and the temperature is a constant. Boyle's law is simply a, simply a, a corollary of the ideal gas equation, a special case of PV equals NRT when the amount of gas and temperature is constant. What, what the technician does during the body box plethysmography is they have the patient do a panting maneuver inside a sealed box where they are moving their lung volumes a small amount called delta V. Because they're inside a sealed box, as they pant and change their volumes small in and out, in and out, there's a corresponding small change of the pressure inside the box. The initial body box pressure in the box is P times V. And based on Boyle's law, any change of pressure must be counteracted by a change of volume, such as P plus delta P times V minus delta V is the same volume, is the same product. If we simplify this equation with algebra, which you can look at for a minute, we just cross multiplied, and we assume that Delta V times delta P is close to zero because it's a small number times a small number. We can determine the body box equation, which in simple terms is the starting volume is proportionate to the starting pressure, and the proportionality constant is the rate of change of volume with pressure. This is just to give you a flavor of how body box works. You don't really need to know any of this. You can consider the body box a black box that magically has the patient pant, measures the relationship to volume and pressure change, and is calibrated to give you the starting volume. That's the whole principle of body box. Using the body box equation, we're able to get the total thoracic gas volume. Finally, in this part of the talk, I want to talk, discuss lung diffusion capacity. The purpose of lung diffusion capacity maneuver is to measure the effective membrane surface area of diffusion in the lung. The value will be decreased if there is either a quantitative defect in lung capacity, such as after a pneumonectomy, or a qualitative defect, which could be seen in obstructive diseases like COPD or in restrictive diseases like pulmonary fibrosis. When we use the word membrane with respect to pulmonary function tests, we're referring to the diffusion barrier between the alveolar space and the red blood cells, which includes the alveolar epithelium, the pulmonary interstitium, and the capillary endothelium. To measure the lung diffusion capacity, we typically use small amounts of carbon monoxide, and we look at the uptake of carbon monoxide per unit of time per the concentration of carbon monoxide used during a 10 breath, 10 second breath hold. We add a little helium in at the same time to simultaneously, simultaneously estimate the volume that the breath was held during the maneuver to make sure the patient took a deep breath in during the maneuver, gave their lungs a fair chance to have a good score. 
Other factors can affect lung diffusion capacity measurement other than the true lung diffusion capacity, especially anemia, which is common, or carboxyhemoglobinemia. Anemia adversely affects the diffusion capacity because there's less red blood cells to sweep away the carbon monoxide, and there's a local tension of carbon monoxide built up on the blood side, which decreases diffusion by lowering the gradient. Carboxyhemoglobin likewise creates a back pressure of carbon monoxide and decreases uptake independent of how the lung is doing. So that would be an artifactual lowering of your score if you have an elevated carboxyhemoglobin level, which is really seen most commonly in heavy smokers. We use carbon monoxide as the tracer because the rate limiting step of carbon monoxide uptake is the pulmonary membrane. Other gases such as oxygen's uptake is determined much more by cardiac output and total oxygen consumption. Therefore, oxygen used for diffusion measurement would be very, very insensitive to true changes in lung diffusion. Op oxygen uptake really depends on your cardiac output and your total body oxygen consumption. That's why we do not use oxygen as the marker of lung diffusion for studying lung diffusion capacity. Graphically, let me show you what lung diffusion capacity looks like. We represent the entire surface area of diffusion as an area, A. This is all of your lung membranes spread out in a sheet. The distance from the, apothel the, cap the alveolar epithelium to the capillary endothelium can re be represented by a distance called L or length. On the alveolar side is oxygen waiting to diffuse. And on the other side of the membrane is the blood capillary bed. And the main object of the lung with respect to oxygen is to move oxygen across the membrane onto the capillary side. The diffusion capacity is proportionate to the area, meaning if we double the area, we would have double the diffusion capacity. And it's inversely proportionate to the length, meaning if we doubled the distance, we would cut the diffusion in half. K is the proportionality constant, which we also call the permeability. Two patients with the same area and length can still have different diffusion capacities based on the health of the membrane. So a very healthy membrane has an elevated permeability constant called K, and a fibrotic or diseased membrane has a low permeability constant. So how do we interpret a low diffusion capacity? First, we make sure that it reflects a true problem with the membrane because if the patient has anemia or carboxyhemoglobin, it may just be reflecting that. And the lab, if, if they're told what the hemoglobin value is, will do a correction factor. So always make sure you supply the lab with their he the patient's hemoglobin, especially if it's more than mildly abnormal. Second of all, we ask, is the diffusion capacity disproportionately low relative to the total lung capacity? Generally, if your diffusion capacity is 40% and your total lung capacity is 80%, we're talking about true lung disease such as COPD, interstitial lung disease, or some sort of flooded alveoli, or we're talking about pulmonary vascular disease such as chronic pulmonary emboli. On the other hand, if the diffusion capacity is proportionately low to relative to TLC, for example, diffusion capacity is 70% and TLC is 70%, we're talking about relatively healthy lung, but not enough lung. Examples of this can be a pneumonectomy, extrinsically compressed but otherwise healthy lung, as seen in obesity or kyphoscoliosis. Finally, what about interpretation of an elevated lung diffusion capacity? We rate these as two classes. Mildly elevated is common in asthma or mild heart failure and is felt to be on the basis of increased blood volume in the lung, which improves the sweeping away of carbon monoxide as it's brought through the membrane. And markedly elevated is a classic sign of pulmonary hemorrhage. What happens is the true lung diffusion capacity is actually terrible 
but carbon monoxide in the lab is taken up by the free blood that is floating around in the air spaces and it dramatically increases the uptake not because the carbon monoxide is transporting through the membranes into the bloodstream just because it's sticking to the free blood so it's really an artifactual marked elevation of lung diffusion capacity but nonetheless it's a very helpful test if someone has pulmonary infiltrates and hemoptysis to see if their hypoxia is due to to, to pulmonary hemorrhage, a markedly elevated diffusion capacity is very good evidence of the mechanism of why someone's diffusion capacity is 200 or 300% of normal. So this